registration. We also have simultaneous translation available to this webinar in French. To those of you who would like to hear the translation streams, please use the live, uh, the interpretation button in Zoom, and please choose your preferred language to hear today's webinar in. We would like to thank Sanofi for supporting this online event through an unrestricted educational grant. Without the support of sponsors like Sanofi, we are unable to bring fantastic events like this to you today, and we thank them for their support. We have four fantastic speakers um, joining us today. The first is Emma Paulino, the president of the National Association of Pharmacists in Portugal. We have Joe Van Boven, who's the chair of the Dutch Respiratory Pharmacists Group. Fiona Mosgrove, who's a general practitioner in NHS Grampian in the UK. And Carmen Mysterio, who's a member of the Respiratory Task Force at the Spanish Society of Community Pharmacy. Today we'll open with a presentation by Emma that talks about today's topic, vaccination needs and benefits for people living with chronic respiratory conditions. We will then have a panel discussion. And as we move through that panel discussion with our esteemed colleagues, we will start to filter in um, questions from the audience. The more questions, the richer this session will be. So please do have those questions ready. If in the opening presentation, there are questions that you'd like us to address in the panel, please by all means start to put those questions to us then. And then we will have closing remarks. The overall time allowed for this session is 90 minutes. We had three objectives today in our presentation. The first is to help you understand the risks that this population group is exposed to with regards to vaccine preventable diseases, as well as the benefits of these people being vaccinated. We're gonna talk about the main recommended vaccines for people who live with chronic respiratory diseases and discuss the roles of pharmacists in supporting health literacy and vaccination of this special risk group. And our first speaker today is Emma Paulino, and I'm really excited to hear what Emma has to say today. Emma is a pharmacist at her own community pharmacy in Portugal. She's the general manager of ESVI, a company that engages community pharmacies in the implementation of patient support programs. Emma is president of the Portuguese National Association of Pharmacies and immediate past professional secretary of FIP. Emma is currently in the board of Pharmaceutical Care Network Europe and a member of the Board of International Primary Care Respiratory Group. So we're very lucky to have Emma with us today and I invite Emma to the floor. Hello everyone and uh, thank you very much uh, for having me here today uh, to talk a little bit about this uh, very interesting topic and congratulations to FIP again for um, being able to um, unite such a terrific panel afterwards to discuss this topic as well. So I will be talking about vaccination needs and benefits for people living with chronic respiratory conditions. And uh, I must apologize in advance for some of the um, uh, slides that I will present because they have a lot of information and a lot of written information, but I, I wanted to make sure that I included all the necessary references and uh, also necessary information regarding the types of vaccines uh, that are most uh, important to uh, include when we are uh, discussing about uh, people living with chronic respiratory conditions and making sure that we prevent complications and that we uh, increase their quality of life. So apologies in advance, I will try to make it as light as possible uh, anyway. So in the next slide, I will uh, briefly show um, uh, burden of disease for the most prevalent uh, respiratory chronic diseases, uh, which are COPD and uh, asthma. So first I show this graphic about COPD burden of uh, disease. Uh, so, and we know that increased life expectancy has had a major impact on the prevalence of chronic respiratory diseases. And in this map, we can see the prevalence of uh, COPD in the um, overall population around the globe. Uh, so just to uh, highlight that uh, in 2015, uh, we had uh, approximately 3.2 million people uh, uh, dying from COPD worldwide, uh, which is an increase of 11.6% uh, compared with 1990. So this is a big uh, uh, 
increase um, for, uh, 50, for 25 years. There was a decrease in age standardized death rate of 41.9%, which is good news, but this was contracted by population growth and aging of the global population. So from 1990 to 2015, the prevalence of COPD actually increased by 44.2%. So uh, we can see how important it is that we uh, acknowledge uh, the prevalence of this disease, that we do everything we can in order to prevent the disease, but then um, uh, when we have a diagnosis, that we then provide the best care to uh, people in order to increase their quality of life. So in the next slide, we can see asthma burden of disease. Uh, so again, uh, very big numbers uh, in terms of uh, mortality. In 2015, we've had 3.2 million people uh, dying from, uh, from um, oh, sorry, in uh, 0.4 million people uh, died from asthma, which uh, represents actually a decrease of 26.7% from 1990, uh, which is very good news. And again, uh, this uh, may mean that uh, we are providing uh, better care for people living with asthma. Uh, and the age standardized death rate uh, actually decreased by 58.8%. So, but what we know is that the prevalence of asthma itself increased by 12.6%. Uh, so uh, again, uh, this is a, a highly prevalent disease and uh, we are seeing an increase in terms of the numbers uh, we are seeing and uh, the number of people that we have to treat in uh, primary and secondary care. In the next slides, uh, I show some of the um, um, information and data about hospital admissions. And we know that usually these hospital admissions for asthma, COPD, and also uh, chronic heart um, failure are considered some of the uh, best indicators to ascertain the quality of uh, primary care. Uh, and uh, when we are looking at hospital admissions uh, for asthma and COPD, the lower they, uh, they are, in, uh, that means that we are preventing complications from these diseases. So uh, it is assumed that the, the care that is being provided in primary care uh, is responding to people's needs. So what we see here uh, is asthma hospital admission um, rates in adults. Uh, we can actually see that Portugal is a, a good, um, a good uh, uh, position in this ranking, but we can see that uh, the, there are differences across the different countries. And we can say that uh, the hospital admission rates uh, for asthma have uh, are varied over 15-fold uh, across uh, OECD countries. Uh, and we, see, we can see some um, countries like Iceland, Mexico, Italy, Colombia, Portugal uh, reporting the lowest rates, whereas Latvia, Turkey and Poland reporting rates that are over twice the OECD uh, average. Uh, so between uh, when we compare uh, the, the data we have from 2009 to 2019, hospital admission rates for asthma actually decreased uh, in uh, many OECD countries. And, uh, and uh, this may mean that we are taking better care of people again um, uh, in primary care, but we should also account for the decrease in terms of um, uh, care uh, that we had during the pandemic, uh, particularly when we are looking at numbers from 2020. So the, in the next slide, we see COPD hospital uh, admissions. So again, we see uh, general declines in hospital admissions in 2020 um, and uh, in 2029 as compared to 2009. Uh, so, uh, and uh, again, this may reflect better care. In any case, uh, we uh, should strive to um, provide even better care for these people. And that's why we are discussing this topic today. So in the next slide, uh, we're talking about the role of community pharmacists and the role of pharmacists in general. So uh, we understand that the journey of people living with chronic illness is very, is very often complex. 
um, and it has multiple contact points and uh, pharmacists have uh, multiple opportunities to interact with people, be it in uh, early stages, like uh, even pre-diagnosis, and we often uh, provide care uh, related to the prevention of disease or even prevention of complica complications. But we also provide care um, from the moment that people have a diagnosis and uh, then we are able to support them in their treatment by increasing patient adherence and uh, particularly in respiratory conditions, providing care to educate people about better use of inhaler, inhalers uh, or even uh, use of the different uh, therapeutic options uh, and the different therapeutic um, uh, uh, Medi uh, well, the different medicines that the doctor has prescribed. Uh, so there are, in fact, a lot of opportunities for the pharmacists to intervene. Uh, and again, one of them is definitely on preventing complications. So in the next slide, and before diving into uh, more information about, about vaccines specifically, uh, we can see that when we are de dealing with asthma and COPD, we have uh, various uh, types of interventions, uh, again, depending on the uh, stage of the patient journey where the patient is at. Uh, so we are talking about patient education, and this is obviously cross-cutting the whole uh, patient journey in terms of uh, the information that we may and should convey in terms of the patient being better uh, equipped with uh, information to better take care of himself uh, or herself. Uh, we have the prevention, and when we are talking about prevention, of course, we are talking about smoking cessation for COPD, we are talking about avoiding triggers for asthma, but we are also talking about uh, preventing complication and exacerbations from the disease, and that's what we uh, are doing uh, in terms of when we are using vaccines. Uh, and we are also talking, like I said, about treatment. And here uh, it is important to use the tools that we have available to discuss with the patient and uh, to ascertain the control that people have uh, over their uh, symptoms. So now we are going to uh, move uh, into uh, talking further about vaccination as uh, a means to uh, prevent uh, complications. And this is something that um, pharmacists are already being able to do uh, directly, uh, not only increasing awareness about the need for vaccination, but also in terms of administering the vaccines themselves in community pharmacies. So we are going to talk basically, or, or to what I'm going to present uh, is uh, references that support uh, these two claims. The first one that people with asthma or COPD are at higher risk for serious uh, uh, problems from certain vaccine preventable diseases. Uh, and the second um, claim is that immunization provides the best protection uh, against vaccine preventable diseases. So we are going to now uh, deep dive into uh, the types of vaccines that are most recommended for adults, uh, specifically for adult, adults uh, that have chronic respir respiratory diseases. Okay, so uh, this slide is uh, like a summary, but uh, in the early stages of the presentation. So when we are talking about vaccination in adults with chronic respiratory diseases, and we look at um, what the recommendations are, we may see different recommendations around the world, uh, but uh, uh, I will be focusing on these five uh, different vaccines, which are the ones that mostly uh, appear uh, when we are looking at guidelines for uh, vaccine, uh, for immunization for people with chronic respiratory diseases and specifically people with asthma and COPD. So uh, we can sum up the recommendations, and this is uh, also based on uh, the Centers for Disease Control in the US, but it's pretty much aligned uh, with a lot of the other global guidelines, and I will be detailing them a little bit uh, further. But most um, uh, of the recommendations are that adults with chronic respiratory diseases should uh, have a flu vaccine every year to protect against seasonal flu. As you know, uh, every year we have different um, uh, variants uh, uh, that occur and vaccines are prepared to uh, specifically address uh, the uh, 
uh, characteristics of the viruses that are expected to be circulating uh, in the northern hemisphere or in the south hemisphere. We also have the pneumococcal vaccines that protect against serious pneumococcal uh, diseases. We have the COVID-19 vaccine whose frequency is yet to be uh, determined uh, in a way. Uh, we are still gathering evidence about this. We have the Tdap vaccine to protect, protect against tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis, which is uh, often called uh, whooping cough. And, for, uh, and uh, although this is uh, a vaccine that uh, is, uh, 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 addresses these three uh, diseases, what we are lo really looking for uh, in terms of uh, the protection for people with chronic respiratory diseases is the whooping cough. And we also have the zoster vaccine to protect against shingles. And uh, this is particularly relevant when people are uh, 50 years and older. So in the next slides, I will uh, give you a few um, references on uh, the recommendations and the guidelines about the different types of vaccines that are recommended. So let's start with vaccination against flu and pneumonia. These are most probably the ones that are most known uh, for all of you, apart from COVID-19 due to um, uh, uh, the uh, recent pandemic uh, situation. So we all know that respiratory viruses, including influenza, rhinovirus, respiratory syncytial uh, virus, and coronaviruses have, have been shown to increase the risk of asthma exacerbations, even in patients with controlled asthma. Uh, however, uh, we uh, have uh, seen that more robust data is actually needed to determine the efficacy of flu and pneumococcal vaccines in reducing complications in patients with asthma. And this has been asserted by a series of publications and even a Cochrane review. Uh, however, the Global Initiative for Asthma 2022 guideline, the updated guideline, still recommends routine vaccination against influenza for eligible individuals because of the vaccine's uh, safety and potential efficacy. Uh, but again, uh, uh, and uh, relating to uh, the pneumococcal vaccination, it argues that there is insufficient evidence to recommend routine pneumococcal vaccination. CDC, however, and that's why I mentioned before that guidelines may be different and it is very important that we uh, keep uh, ourselves updated into our own national um, recommendations and guidelines. CDC, uh, however, recommends it as it offers the most protection for those who are vulnerable. So we do have a lot of evidence um, showing that uh, people who are vulnerable and particularly uh, those that are uh, aged 65 years and older do benefit from uh, pneumococcal vaccination. So irrespective of uh, having asthma or not, what is very important is to note that there is research uh, that has shown that uh, neither flu or pneumococcal vaccines increase the risk of um, uh, ex asthma exacerbations. So it is not contraindicated in people who have, who have uh, asthma. So in the next slide, um, it, more about COPD, which is, um, uh, which is a different uh, situation. So we also have data uh, that... Uh, um, shows us that respiratory infections can trigger 50% to 70% <clears throat> I'm sorry, of COPD exacerbations. Uh, and we do know, and we do have evidence that flu and pneumonia vaccines help reduce the risk of exacerbations, serious illness and death, and are therefore recommended by WHO, the CDC, and also the International Global Initiative for Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease, so the GOLD 2022 guidelines for all people living with COPD. So we have here a different situation from asthma. Uh, we also know, and there is evidence, and I included a reference for that, that pharmacists can improve the vaccination rate among people with COPD by recognizing the factors that influence the decision by acting as counselors. So identifying people who have not been vaccinated 
uh, and uh, they can promote uh, the administration of the vac vaccines in the pharmacy itself, which increases vac vaccination uptake as well. So uh, different situation for COPD than we have uh, with the flu, and that's why I separated them into diff two different slides when talking about vaccination against flu and pneumonia. So in the next slide, we are going to talk about vaccination against uh, COVID-19. As I've mentioned before, we are still uh, gathering evidence about um, uh, several factors. We've had conflicting evidence also because um, initially we had very low numbers of uh, people, uh, but now we are increasing that body of evidence. And we have already uh, seen systematic reviews published that have not shown uh, shown an increased risk of severe COVID-19 in people with well-controlled mild to moderate asthma, but the risk of COVID death was increased in people who had recently needed oral corticosteroids and in hospitalized patients with severe asthma. So for patients who are not controlled, uh, we can see that there is an increase in terms of the, uh, the complications for COVID. We also know that COPD significantly increases the odds of poor clinical outcomes in patients with COVID-19. Uh, and uh, therefore, both GINA and GOLD, so the guidelines for the, internet, uh, the international uh, bodies for uh, the recommendations and guidelines for asthma and COPD patients, both recommend that people with asthma and COPD should be up to date with COVID-19 vaccination, including the booster doses, if available, as per national recommendations. Uh, so, and uh, just a short uh, note saying that uh, nowadays COVID-19 vaccination and influenza vaccination may be given on the same day. Uh, because And this is important because uh, initially the, there was a recommendation to uh, separate the, the dates of administration by at least 15 days. So now uh, there, there, there is this possibility to administer both on the same day. Now we move on to the vaccination against uh, whooping cough. So uh, as we know, whooping cough mainly affects children. However, we have uh, very recent evidence uh, and uh, publications that show us that adults also get uh, whooping cough. Uh, but the diagnosis is often more difficult uh, since it can be presented with nonspecific symptoms such as prolonged cough or even a milder one in those who were previously vaccinated in their childhood. Uh, so the publications also show us the number of cases uh, are more frequent than reported and the proportion has been increasing over time. Uh, so we see both CDC and GOLD 2022 um, recommend the Tdap vaccination in COPD and asthma patients who were not vaccinated in adolescence. So uh, this is something to, um, to uh, be aware uh, about. This is not as talked about as the other types of uh, vaccines I've mentioned previously, but again, there's recommendation uh, for uh, vaccinating against whooping cough as well. And in the next slide, uh, we um, are talking about shingles, so uh, herpes uh, zoster. Uh, so we also have evidence showing that the risk of uh, developing herpes uh, zoster has been reported to be from 50% to over 200% higher in people with COPD versus without COPD. Uh, and uh, most importantly, most people with COPD are completely unaware of this increased risk. So this is, an, again, another opportunity for the pharmacists uh, to be able to make people aware of this increased risk and, um, and to uh, recommend vaccination. So uh, we see uh, the CDC recommending the uh, herpes zoster vaccine for adults with COPD that are aged uh, older than 50 years, and uh, GOLD 2022 also references its use. Uh, for asthma, we do not have a reference about uh, this uh, in the GINA guidelines. Well, and uh, 
Well, to finalize about vaccination benefits, I've told about the increased risk. And in some cases, I've presented some uh, data. There, are, there is obviously a lot of data and uh, different uh, publications. Uh, I've tried to include systematic reviews when available. So you are able to uh, go into those and also see other studies that have shown uh, both the increased risk uh, and also the benefits for specific types of vaccines for uh, people with chronic respiratory uh, diseases. In this slide, I'm just summarizing the overall vaccination benefits. Uh, so we are looking at uh, vaccines positively impacting health, cognitive development and productivity. Uh, we have people leading healthier lives. Uh, we have less severe forms of disease. We've seen that with COVID-19 as well, as you know. We have fewer limitations in terms of family and social interactions uh, due to the uh, less severe forms of disease uh, as well and better functional uh, ability. Uh, also, we know that most vaccines uh, have a broad impact on health, extending beyond the vaccinated individual. We uh, often talk about the herd immunity uh, concept, um, which uh, is um, works for certain vaccines, not so much for others, because depending on the type of uh, vaccine and disease, people may, may be more or less capable of transmitting the, the disease if they are vaccinated. However, for most vaccines, we see this, um, uh, this situation where uh, there is a broad impact on health extending beyond the vaccinated individual, which, which is particularly important when we are talking about protecting people who cannot be vaccinated uh, due to several reasons like allergies or uh, certain types of contraindications, which are rare but can occur. So we also know that vaccines are cost effective and cost saving. And this is very important because most often in the different countries, there's the national vaccination plan and there's investment from the national healthcare system or from uh, insurers, making sure that we uh, have vaccines available. And this is of course, because uh, we will prevent not only clinical manifestations and uh, loss of productivity, et cetera, uh, but we are actually saving money from, um, from uh, more complicated care that has to be uh, made available for people who would otherwise have uh, more uh, severe forms of the, the diseases that uh, I've mentioned. And there's this uh, hashtag, which uh, I would really like to suggest that you follow the hashtag vaccine save lives. Of course, vaccine save lives. It's not only about healthier lives and less severe forms of disease. People uh, can actually uh, die from complications of diseases and from these diseases themselves. So um, it is very important that we take every opportunity as a pharmacist uh, and uh, within the overall healthcare team to uh, advocate for uh, vaccine uh, taking. And the uh, uh, last slide, uh, before I move to a more conceptual uh, slide, opportunities for improvement. Of course, we need additional training of the pharmacist and other pharmacy staff to be able to convey the correct information. Uh, and hopefully this uh, webinar will also um, help uh, in this uh, increased competencies. Uh, we have to raise awareness of the pharmacist's contribution uh, to other healthcare professionals, to the patients themselves, the systems overall. Uh, we have to ensure that we uh, have pharmaceutical interventions that are sustainable over time. And for this, we need adequate remuneration systems. Okay, sorry, I, I thought I lost you there. Um, adequate remuneration systems. Uh, so uh, it is important that we um, uh, that we have this uh, the the value that is uh, connected to the vaccination that this is shared with the pharmacy teams. We have to uh, ensure that there is integration of health information technologies, and maybe we can uh, talk a little bit about that in the uh, panel discussion because, uh, for instance, in Portugal. 
we are able to immunize, we are able to feed the electronic vaccination um, record, but we are not able to read it. So we are not able to identify when people have something missing in their uh, vaccine schemes uh, or even know if we are administering uh, a duplicated vaccine. So this is very important that we ensure that we have integration of health information technologies. And we need uh, obviously increased physician pharmacist collaboration uh, and not only physician pharmacists, but actually with the overall healthcare team so that we are uh, aligned in terms of the messages that we are conveying and the recommendations that we are um, um, transmitting to the, the patient. And my last slide is actually um, an image that I really like because uh, it's really about people-centered care. Uh, it's not about patient-centered care. It's beyond the patient. So it's before the patient, uh, let's say so. We have to start early, very early on. And vaccines are an excellent example for that because uh, obviously we are administering vaccines in babies uh, to ensure that they have healthier lives. Uh, and uh, this people-centered care um, is uh, only achievable if we work together, social, private, and public sectors, if we work in a multidisciplinary way, and if we consider that all the determinants of health are considered when we are talking about uh, people's growth uh, and um, uh, needs. It's about the education system. It's about uh, adequate uh, home um, placements. Uh, it's about uh, integrated um, healthcare facilities and integrated multidisciplinary teams. So this is uh, my last message uh, to you. Uh, and now, of course, I'm uh, available for any questions you may have about these slides and looking forward to interact with the colleagues in the panel discussion. Thank you very much. What a fantastic presentation to start our discussion today. Thank you very much for that, Emma. I really liked the hashtag vaccine saves lives. It's one I've used on social media um, through the pandemic to talk about the value of vaccination. If you are joining the conversation on Twitter today through this webinar, please do include at FIP.org as a hashtag so we can all be part of that conversation as well. Um, and now I'd like to introduce our other speakers on the panel today, and I'll, I'll introduce each one individually, and then I'll get them to turn their camera on, and we can have a really great discussion. Just as a reminder, we have the Q&A box. As many questions, I have lots of questions after Emma's presentation, but I want to hear yours. Please do send them through to our Q&A box. We'll answer as many of them as we can in our discussion today. Um, and there may be some of those we can answer directly as well. I can see some great chats coming through, but we really want to see some great questions. Uh, and as a reminder, we will have a certificate for those who have attended and registered for the live webinar today. There's some notes about that in the chat. Um, so rest assured your attendance will be able to be recorded as well. So I'll now introduce our panelists. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Joe Van Boven, who is the Assistant Professor um, Chair of the Dutch Respiratory Pharmacist Group and is at the University Medical Centre Groningen, um, also linked to KNMP. Um, he is a pharmacist and assistant professor in the Netherlands and has published over 140 papers on respiratory drug use and leads an academic research group of 10 PhD students. So we have some fantastic experience there. Our next speaker, uh, or next panellist rather, is Dr Fiona Mosgrove, who is a general practitioner at NHS Grampian. Fiona has been a GP for 10 years and has a passion for respiratory medicine. She sits on the PCRS Education Committee and the IPCRG Sentinel Network Project. So really, really fantastic to have Fiona's experience on the panel today. And our final panellist is Carmen Baldondido Mysterio, who is a community pharmacist and member of the Respiratory Task Force of the Spanish Society of Community Pharmacy. Carmen currently works as a community pharmacist in Spain, and she has worked in the UK as a community pharmacist for four years. She's a PhD student at the University of Oviedo and a member of the Respiratory Task Force of the Spanish Society of Clinical and Familiar and Community Pharmacy. 
So we have academia represented, we have community pharmacy experience represented, general practice experience represented. So we have a really, really fantastic group of people to talk to today. So please do send your questions to the Q&A too. Now we have all of our speakers on camera. I'll get the slide to be removed so we can see everyone's excited faces. Um, and I, I think um, Emma has left me with so many questions, but we'll let Emma have a rest to start with. And I'll possibly move um, to Joe first. You've got some fantastic experience in um, re research about respiratory diseases. Do we have any data, Emma mentioned, about um, a low awareness of the need and, and risk that this cohort have? What do we know in terms of data or from the work that you've done in terms of people's awareness, if they have a respiratory condition, that they really do need some of these vaccines? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And if we want to um, increase the uptake of vaccines, it starts with awareness. And unfortunately, many of the high risk groups of people living with asthma or COPD are, are not receiving a vaccine they, they would need. So some of the data we, we, we looked at ourselves, for example, uh, from Spain suggests that around 60% of people with COPD they get an influenza vaccination each year, for example. So there, there's 40% room for, for improvement. And uh, looking at other countries, uh, it fluctuates, of course, uh, depending on the one hand, indeed awareness, but also access to, uh, to the vaccine. It's a huge barrier, I think. We, 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 we as pharmacists can, can definitely help with with both issues. Um, and, and, and unfortunately, in my country, pharmacists are not allowed to vaccinate, but I know other countries, especially during COVID, we saw a huge uptake of countries allowing pharmacists to vaccinate. And I think there's definitely a huge gain. Um, Fiona, what has been your observation with your patients that you've worked with in terms of their awareness? I was really quite alarmed when Emma was speaking about people who are at risk of quite severe complications from some infectious diseases not being aware of uh, the need for vaccination. How do you start that conversation with your patients or is it something they pick up outside the consult room? Yeah, that's a, a great uh, question. Thanks, Peter. Um, I think it varies really widely and I think, um, you know, health inequalities really comes into play here. So I have got lots of patients who are very aware of their need for vaccination and unaware of the benefits. And and I think those patients tend to have high levels of trust in vaccinations as a core concept. And then I equally have lots of patients who are um, not aware about the benefits of vaccination. Um, and, and those tend to be the patients that live in more deprived circumstances. And those conversations can be quite challenging because the level of trust um, that we sometimes see in vaccinations isn't um, there. And I think that some of the Sort of media in the last couple of years has has brought that to the fore so I think there's the definite divide there um, and it can be really challenging to have those those conversations definitely. Carmen you practice in a few different countries are there issues similar when you practice in different areas or are the themes very similar in terms of patient awareness? Right. Um, yeah, I had the opportunity to work in the UK for a few years and um, and in Spain, unfortunately, we are not allowed to vaccinate um, from pharmacies, which I think is uh, something very negative to in order to get a higher rate of uptake. Um, and in terms of, of patients, um, I think there are two main uh, problems one is more related to healthcare professionals, as healthcare professionals are the most trusted uh, source of information around vaccination. Uh, we play an important role in motivating, reassuring, and uh, convincing patients to get vaccinated. Uh, according to some studies, uh, one of them published this year by Pablo et al, uh, healthcare professionals in Europe, uh, even though the majority of them are um, confidence with vaccination, some of them are uh, getting more uh, hesitant and they are refusing vaccines for themselves and avoiding recommending certain vaccines for their patients. So I think if they, um, if they don't recommend vaccination for their patients, um, patients may not even think about having them. And also in terms of patients, um, 
they they may feel a, a lack of confidence they may feel they are not safe they are not um efficient um it might be a, a lack of awareness as my colleague was saying before uh, they might feel uh, do i really need this vaccine is is would it change anything uh, and they might have uh, bad experience with uh, health services and and another thing that um, I think uh, Fiona or or Joe were saying before is uh, this information overload that we have been um, seeing with the pandemic, uh, all all that information that is in the in the net and the fake news. So, um, in my opinion, vaccination should come into our minds. Uh, we should do everything we can as healthcare professionals to raise awareness throughout healthcare professionals in order to influence vaccination of uh, our patients. Um, probably doing webinars like this one and making consensus documents with uh, scientific societies and uh, associations, using social media as a tool to offer um, evidence-based information to to general population and, and obviously to reject the these fake news that are all around i think the situation is is similar uh, between spain and and the uk the the only difference is that we are uh, not allowed to do vaccination in pharmacies so we just can do education for our patients we can um, reinforce the prescriber recommendations and refer those patients to get those vaccines but uh, in other terms, I think it's, it's pretty similar. There's so much in that answer I want to explore. You made <laughs> some really, really interesting <laughs> points. Uh, one of which was that um, the work of webinars and, and scientific organisations in addressing misinformation. FIP have run some great events over the last 18 months or two years, and I encourage people to go back through the database of those. The World Health Organization has some great resources on their website about addressing misinformation. And in countries where there is a high trust in government, many of those government bodies will also have great resources for trying to address misinformation as well. So as health professionals, we need to be across um, the, tech, other, the, the strategies that we know will work at being accurate for misinformation. Um, otherwise, you'll end up with a lot of energy and not achieving a particularly good outcome for that patient. Um, Emma, Peter, you... can I add something? I think a great initiative that FRP is now developing is the handbook for chronic respiratory diseases specifically developed for pharmacists. And I know Emma is also involved in the writing of the book, but I think for pharmacists having their own guideline for respiratory diseases globally would, would really help because I think there's still a lack of uh, guidelines uh, specifically for pharmacists. And that I think would be a, a real game changer as well. Very much so. The, um, there's a question that's coming for Emma, so I'll, I'll jump to that one now before I go through some of the other unpacking that um, brilliant response. We have a question from Sven, Emma, that's asking, uh, first of all, thank you for your great presentation, and I completely agree with that, um, but they're keen to find out more about your experience in a public pharmacy regarding acceptance of people being vaccinated in the pharmacy. Um, they'd like to know, did it work out fine? How was it remunerated? And did you find in that case a conflict with medical practitioners? And what supports were available in case of severe reactions? Um, I've been a pharmacist vaccinator, so I'm happy to add my thoughts in as well. But Emma, um, what's your response to that? Yes, so we've had uh, we have uh, vaccination by pharmacists in Portugal in community pharmacy since 2008. Uh, and I must say that immediately it was a huge success, both in terms of uptake by pharmacists themselves. Uh, we trained uh, in the first year for vaccination. We uh, trained over 2,000 pharmacists, uh, which uh, meant that uh, uh, approximately uh, uh, immediately half of the Portuguese pharmacies were uh, available to administer vaccines uh, to patients in the first flu season. So we have a very 
uh, big uptake in terms of community pharmacies and uh, we had a very big acceptance rate from patients themselves as well uh, so uh, we've had uh, no issues um, with the uh, doctors with the physicians actually uh, I do believe that they they uh, they thought that this uh, was a good initiative to um, increase the uptake of uh, vaccines and uh, increase vaccination coverage so they they were quite supportive and are quite supportive of of, uh, the pharmacist's role uh, in this uh, regard. Uh, and um, uh, uh, in terms of the uh, remuneration, uh, patients actually have to pay out of pocket for the, the administration service, the vaccine administration service in pharmacies, but they, they happily uh, pay for the service because they, they recognize the convenience uh, and uh, there is, a, like I mentioned, the high satisfaction rate in terms of the level of service and the quality of the service that is provided. Uh, and uh, we've did, we did several surveys about uh, that. Uh, and uh, that was uh, the overall uh, feeling of the population. So they are willing to pay out of pocket for this service. Of course, we are in Portugal uh, trying to get remuneration from the national healthcare system for the service that we are providing. But at the moment, we still have uh, um, the uh, vaccination service uh, paid for out of pocket by the patients or in some circumstances uh, by municipalities uh, or uh, big employer groups uh, that are willing to pay on behalf of their um, employees or on behalf of the citizens of that uh, specific municipality and specifically for uh, flu vaccines um, every season. Uh, but uh, there are a number of countries already internationally uh, where pharmacies uh, and pharmacists are being paid for by national healthcare systems or insurers. Uh, in, in fact, in Portugal, we also have a, one insurer that is also paying for the administration service. Uh, so we have several examples of where we have seen remuneration uh, by third parties. Uh, so I think that this is important. And uh, you can access this information in FIP reports, which you can find on the FIP website. Um, as for the last question about the anaphylactic reactions, well, we are actually, uh, I believe that in Portugal, we are actually uh, outside the st statistics. Uh, we've been administering millions of vaccines since 2008, we, and we haven't had a, an anaphylactic reaction in a community pharmacy yet, but uh, we are trained to deal with anaphylactic reactions. All pharmacists have to uh, undergo specific training they are prepared, we are required to have infrastructures and equipment uh, to deal with an anaphylactic reaction. And we also have to have training on basic life support. Uh, so, and I think that this is the case in uh, countries where we have pharmacists immunizing. Uh, so we are able to deal with that anaph anaphylactic reaction. And uh, of course, we uh, engage with the national emergency number to deploy uh, the necessary um, healthcare professionals and equipment uh, to the community pharmacy if that occurs. However, like I said, we've, uh, we haven't had uh, that situation yet. We have had some mild reactions and vagal reactions and uh, those sorts of things, uh, particularly in men young men, uh, but um, overall, we haven't had uh, any serious issues in, uh, in pharmacies. Um, and that comment about safety is, is a really important one. Um, the same pharmacists, um, doctors, nurses, and others who vaccinate are, need to be all held to the same standards in terms of patient safety and governments around the world, of, um, particularly through the COVID-19 vaccine, we've really accelerated the um, the ease of reporting of adverse reactions in many cases, but also the digital register. And Emma, I'm coming back to that example that you mentioned uh, earlier. And I think the other example, there was a question about acceptance. In Australia, we're a country of 25 million people, um, over seven and a half million COVID-19 vaccines were administered through community pharmacies in Australia. We also had pharmacies working in general practice administering vaccines and pharmacies, pharmacists working in, in mass vaccination centres and um, Aboriginal health organisations um, for our First Nations people as well. And pharmacists have also administered 2 million flu vaccines this winter. We're going through quite a surge. Um, so it shows the patient acceptance is high. We're, we're probably around a third of the doses delivered in the sort of primary care space around um, general practice and pharmacy um, in Australia, but that has 
the pandemic has accelerated that and that's in, as we've demonstrated safety in, in younger and younger population cohorts, we can now administer down to the age of five in many states for some vaccines in Australia as well. Um, but kids aren't the main focus today. We're talking about um, older mm -hmm. people with respiratory conditions. And Fiona, I had a question for you about, um, Emma identified a whole range of different vaccines with all quite variable schedules. How do you engage people with respiratory conditions once they become eligible? I guess when they first become eligible, it might be an easy thing to remember in the consultation. How do you make sure they come back for the follow-up ones when they become due? Because they're all on quite different schedules. Yeah, that, that can be a, a, a bit of a challenge. I think the first thing is making sure that the healthcare professionals, that everyone involved in delivering and vaccinations and care generally for people with respiratory diseases knows what the schedule is. And, um, and that we've got systems in place to flag up when people are, are due. I think increasingly in my practice, I think it's important that we, that we make it clear to patients, um, you know, as part, if, if this is a core part of the treatment, and we know that vaccines for certainly things like COPD are, are one of the most valuable interventions we can provide for them. So we're quite good at doing reviews and bringing them back to be seen. But I think we also need to be good at saying, so you've had this vaccine now and you need it again in a year or you need it again in X number of years so that patients are actually empowered because in doing that, we make it part of the culture of their um, illness care, that that's just a norm, rather than I think sometimes it's seen as a, a sort of added extra. Um, and, it, and it's definitely not that. It is absolutely critical that, that we vaccinate our, our patients with respiratory diseases. So I think as with most things, sort of knowledge and, and education and awareness across groups, but particularly with patients, um, because if we can empower patients to, to feel involved in their care, I think that's probably quite quite useful. And actually, that really last that, that last slide that Emma had, that lovely slide about people and, and the whole community, I think that that bit is a real big part of that slide. So if you're telling patients you need to have this as a vaccine, you need to have every X number of years, then that will spread beyond them into the community they, that they live in and then that will become a bit more of a norm. That's a fantastic point about the, the, the power of the word of mouth um, and accepting uh, normal care. Um, jo, Emma mentioned in her presentation that people who have, say, uncontrolled asthma or uncontrolled COPD are at, at higher risk of severe complications should we be finding ways to systemise conversations about vaccination when people might be getting medicines for a flare-up of some of these conditions? Sorry, sorry. Can, you, can you repeat the question? Uh, so Emma mentioned in her presentation that um, people who have poorly controlled respiratory conditions are at higher risk of severe complications um, of COVID-19 or, or possibly other conditions. When someone might come into a pharmacy or you might be seeing a patient in a, in a clinic room where they are having a flare-up or an exacerbation of their respiratory condition, should vaccination somehow become a normal part of the conversation about, well, you need to be thinking about this now because you're actually not good, have good control? I think that's, that's an excellent uh, point during uh, where patients would really see the urgency of, uh, of, of vaccination. I think the, the, the moment of a flare-up is the moment to talk about optimization of therapy. Uh, and that includes also the regular stuff, of course, like optimizing inhaler technique, uh, adherence, but also talking about the possibility of vaccination and how this, it's actually one of the easiest interventions one could do to, uh, to lower the number of exacerbations in the end of flare-ups. So it's, I think it, it's low hanging fruit uh, for that. Uh, excellent. And good to know my mind wasn't going down the wrong direction there. Uh, we've talked a little bit about some of the, the barriers in terms of awareness. Um, Carmen, what are some of the other barriers, and maybe cost as well, Carmen, what are some of the other barriers that people with respiratory conditions have in accessing the vaccinations they need at the time that they need them? Right. Um, as I was saying before, I think uh, the barriers are focusing two points. One is the uh, healthcare professional. Um, and one um, with the patients, um, but also the pathway. I mean, um, 
is, is what we were saying in Spain, we are not allowed to vaccinate in the pharmacy. So uh, for that people to get vaccinated, they have to uh, get an appointment, they have to go to their surgeries, uh, have an appointment with a nurse to get that vaccine done. And if they want to go to um, private clinics, they have to pay um, a lot to get that vaccine done. And um, I think that may not help, especially with uh, those active uh, respiratory patients. I mean, those that are still not retired, so they don't have uh, all that time to to go to to get those appointments uh, that are usually in in the morning, at least in Spain. I don't know in other places. Um, you said there's a high cost. How much does that service cost somebody? I know. I don't know. It depends, but uh, they might need to uh, pay fifty euros to go and and just for the appointment in in any private clinic. While when I was working in in the UK, I was seeing in the pharmacy for those people that had to pay for the vaccine, they were just needing to pay. I don't know. In that time, it was around eight pounds. So I think there's a big difference. Like they could just walk in and get that vaccine done. Yeah, rather than needing an appointment, going to a clinic, and and so. Um, and to what extent do you think vaccine fatigue? We've sort of had a COVID nineteen campaign, which was initially two doses, then three in some countries now more. Um, are people sort of turned off the idea of vaccination, particularly those who are in that at, those at risk groups and were probably prioritised fairly? early on, I think I'd probably value a perspective of, of all of our panellists on this, because I suspect it might be a little different in different locations. So um, Fiona, we might start with you and then Emma. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I think you're absolutely right. I think vaccine fatigue is, is a bit of an issue. And I, and I think, I guess the danger is that vaccines are lumped in all together in people's thinking. So they're very much seen as a whole. And I think all of the uh, information and misinformation around COVID vaccination has kind of got people quite tired, I think, with uh, with engaging in that that debate or, or discussion. Um, so I think it, it can be a struggle. And, and I and I guess in, in my experience of talking to lots of patients, particularly about COVID vaccination, there are those that really value just having somebody sensible to talk to about it who will give them a balanced opinion at, or what they what what sounds like a balanced opinion in terms of a realistic view of the benefits and any sort of potential side effects or negative points and and for those i've had a couple of patients who found it really helpful and said that's brilliant i'm i'm glad i've talked to you about it i'll you know i feel much happier about it now um and then there are there are an equal number of patients who either don't want to discuss it at all and just will probably put the phone down on you if you even men mentioned vaccination or are very fixed in their views from sources of information that they would view as being reputable but but perhaps aren't and, and I, so i think for me yes vaccine fatigue is, is a, a big issue and, and it's probably about targeting those patients where you can make a difference in the unfortunate knowledge that there are probably a, a reasonable percentage where um, misinformation on, on vaccination has unfortunately done a fair, fair bit of harm that might be um, not that easy to unpick. Mm. Emma, is your experience similar? Yes, it is similar. I, I do believe that we have to uh, uh, adapt and adjust our message to the, uh, the person that we have in front of us. Uh, of course, uh, although I think that, that we may, um, we, we have to acknowledge that there might be some, um, some vaccine fatigue. I also think that the, this whole uh, pandemic also uh, uh, brought this topic higher in the agenda. So there's these uh, two conflicting uh, movements in, in a sense. Uh, so I do think that uh, when we look at the end of the equation, it's actually on the positive side in terms of uh, 
Uh, I do think that the population is nowadays more aware of uh, the benefits of vaccines, of the importance uh, of vaccines uh, and uh, the investment on public health in general, uh, where vaccines are also a part uh, of, uh, because this, uh, the vaccine hesitancy movement um, was already happening before the COVID-19 pandemic, and we were hearing about these uh, pockets of um, certain diseases uh, in Italy and in, in different in the US uh, so in different countries uh, where we were seeing some vaccine hesitancy because people were forgetting about what uh, what a, a world without vaccines could be and now we know uh, how uh, a, a world where vaccines exist um, uh, and not exist uh, what type of impact it has on the economy and on our social interactions, etc. So I do think that in a way, we have to account for the vaccine uh, fatigue in a way. So we have to keep uh, talking to people and about the importance of vaccine. But I do think that overall, at the end of this pandemic, it, uh, there is a positive uh, side uh, on it in terms of the overall um, awareness of uh, vaccine importance. That's my take on it. Um, it's a great take. Um, Joe. do we have a health workforce that's possibly vaccine fatigued in well in terms of we have been pushing these really important messages in an emergency situation and I guess the thought about engaging patients in, in other vaccines might all be a bit much when we all want a holiday. How do we keep our health work, workers across the world motivated? No, I, I think um, first I'd like to say uh, to second uh, Emma's comment and talking about healthcare workers, um, what I noticed in, in our hospital, so we have an annual campaign to vaccinate ourselves, our, the healthcare workers in our hospital, and usually these vaccination rates are very low, unfortunately, among healthcare workers themselves. Um, but this year, we saw a huge increase in the people, our, our own doctors, pharmacists, nurses in our hospital that got a flu vaccine, for example. So I think there's definitely a positive side of seeing the, the huge impact of, of an infectious disease uh, on, on a global scale. So that, that's what I would like to add here. And actually, I think it, it's seeing and getting all this attention for vaccines, I think we got even more motivated as, as healthcare professionals, at least in my uh, hospital and in the Netherlands. Um, and it also actually um, motivated the pharmacists to, um, to, 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 to start vaccinating as well. So we had a few pilots in, 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 in the Netherlands. It's still not a regular, it's not legislated yet, but I think it's, it has a positive side, the, 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 the pandemic on, on other vaccinations. So no, I don't, I don't see a fatigue in our healthcare uh, community. Excellent. Um, Carmen, we've spoken a bit about fatigue and misinformation and, and topics of that nature, and we've kind of skirted around some of the strategies pharmacists can use to promote vaccination. But sort of if we look a bit more broadly than misinformation and, and the, the pandemic, what does the evidence or what does experience show is really good at helping pharmacists promote vaccination to their patients? I mean, um, right. I think, as I was saying before, we should use social media to offer evidence-based information to to general population um, and to turn those fake news into evidence-based news. So they will be able to, to know the reality of the recommendations for themselves in these specific groups. They need to know uh, what benefits they can get from, from vaccination and what vaccines are recommended for themselves. I think this pandemic has helped in, it hasn't in terms of um, fake news, uh, around vaccination, but it does have help in terms of uh, things like even uh, the co-administration of vaccines with with the COVID nineteen and influenza, which is something that has happened in in many different places. In here in Spain, in some regions, uh, we have uh, reached 
higher uh, vaccination rates of influenza thanks to um, that vaccine given at the same time as the COVID-19 one. Excellent. Um, we haven't had many questions in the Q&A box in the last couple of minutes, so do add your questions in the Q&A box. We're very keen to hear what you'd like to know, particularly focusing on people with respiratory conditions like COPD um, and like asthma. And um, I think to the point that Joe made about healthcare workers being really motivated by, and Emma made too, about being motivated by a world without vaccines or a real focus on vaccine. Certainly in the early stages of the pandemic, we saw people with respiratory conditions taking very, very strict um, isolation measures to protect themselves and, and being quite early to vaccination. But uh, a, a condition um, like herpes zoster might be a very foreign word to those people. How do we go about starting that conversation about a disease they're not even aware of? And I think, Joe, we might start with you on that one. Yeah, that's that's a, 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 yeah, a bit odd uh, indeed vaccination that you don't think of immediately talking about respiratory diseases. And actually, um, it, it's not something we commonly recommend in the Netherlands to do. So it's, it's something that, that, that I think here the awareness should, should even be, uh, be raised even more because I think for influenza, pneumococcal, COVID, I think these three are are very clear, for, especially for, for COPD, uh, for, for asthma, the pneumococcal vaccination in the Netherlands is not typically recommended, but especially herpes zoster, I think. Um, I don't think many uh, healthcare professionals even would be aware that this would be uh, recommended by at least by the CDC. I, I know in the Dutch guidelines, it's, it's not been mentioned somewhere, but it's, it could be something that, that needs more attention, in, in my opinion, as long as we have good evidence uh, for this, of course. Um, Emma, you mentioned that you contribute in your country to the National Vaccine Register, where people's vaccines are recorded, but you don't have access to it. Um, how do you have a really positive conversation with your patients about vaccination if you can't find the key information you need to inform what vaccinations they actually need? That's a very good question and uh, one that we are um, taking back to the health ministry <laughs> for them to respond. Well, we are hopeful that that will change uh, very soon and that we are able to uh, look at, well, to access data. For the moment, what patients can do is uh, we have an electronic file and uh, if they access their own uh, uh, electronic file, then they can uh, show us, uh, but we do not have access as a pharmacist. And uh, so it is not registered and uh, it's not traceable in terms of the information that we uh, get to see and, um, uh, and uh, which we use in our interactions. Uh, it's all in the name of the data protection uh, situation. Uh, although in Portugal legislation does state that the data uh, pertains to the patient. So the patient is the owner of the data. So if he's the owner of the data, he should, he should uh, actually be able to share his data uh, with uh, whomever uh, he would like, but uh, that's not the situation that we have at the moment. We are hopeful uh, that, uh, and we have uh, started conversations. Um, well, actually we've been in these conversations for some years, but we've started these conversations with the new uh, government and we are hopeful that, that this will change in the near future. Because as you, uh, as you implied in your question, how can we uh, have a conversation with patients if we do not know if vaccines are missing or if, if we are administering um, a vaccine that is a duplication from a service that has been already provided somewhere else. Uh, and this is obviously a concern for us in terms of patient safety. So hopefully that will change very soon. And certainly in Australia through vaccinating um, our communities recently, we have a national immunization register any health professional who is providing vaccination is able to access that. There are opt-out provisions, but very few use that provision. Um, and most of our clinical software now has that available. Um, one or two clicks from your dispensing software for patients who have, are not opted out of the My Health Record system, um, but also it's now an expectation of health workers to look at that record prior to providing a vaccination. And that's certainly been very useful um, 
but it has to be systemized effectively you know, in, with the health technology that we have. Otherwise, it becomes a, a further barrier to providing the care. Um, Fiona, do you use um, immunisation registers to help inform your conversations with people with respiratory diseases? Um, so the primary responsibility for vaccination um, has changed a little bit um, in, in Scotland um, in recent times. So um, we used to deliver a lot of the vaccinations and they've been sort of centralised now, which is a bit of a challenge. Um, we can still have the conversations around them and prior to the change that the the responsibility sat very much with us um, as practices and individuals within those um, but I think again coming back to Emma's uh, excellent slide about that person-centered care mm -hmm. um, I think if we can have as many sources of uh, information about vaccination available to patients I think that's really helpful so whether it's from seeing posters in the waiting room at your surgery or when you go um, to pick up your prescription. Um, I think um, that's something that historically, I think when we were in charge of vaccinations, we were fairly good at was just promoting it and making people aware of it. So that might be when they were coming in for their appointments um, and it might be um, sending out information uh, as part of the programme to say, we've made you an appointment or you can now make an appointment for your vaccination. I think increasingly in lots of discussions about different aspects of healthcare, you can see that, that having registers that lots of healthcare professionals can access definitely serves the, the patient better than these very siloed um, models that we currently have because really that maximizes, that allows practitioners to maximize their contact with the patient in seeing okay they've got these things they don't have these things they need this vaccination i've got a bit of time let's have a chat about that so i think i can feel that there's a move towards that and i think if we can do that it's a really positive thing for patients because ultimately when they come to see us they kind of expect that we have everything there whoever whoever it is that they're seeing and and often we have to say well actually i can't i can't see that bit i don't know and very often our patients don't remember what they had when they had it oh I think it was maybe that but I'm not sure you know so I think that is a really big priority I think globally is is for us to have that um good access across healthcare professionals to help patients excellent um Carmen we've spoken about co-administration of both COVID-19 and influenza vaccination today and certainly that's something that um we're seeing a lot more of are there other vaccines for people with respiratory conditions that we should be thinking about co-administration as well? Yes, yeah, so um, co-administration has been shown to be uh, very positive and um, there are enough evidence, I mean, there's, there are studies that show that um, almost all the, the recommended vaccines for respiratory patients uh, could be co-administered. Uh, such as um, influenza with pneumococcal or um, herpes toaster with um, petasis with uh, influenza with pneumococcal vaccines. Um, so I think it's, it's something quite good in terms of compliance for patients. Uh, Joe, have you got something to add to that? Yeah, I think for vaccines, that's um, that's an easy way to, to, to improve compliance and then minimize the number of visits needed. One comment I would like to make here, and this is probably because I'm working in a secondary care, so we, we, apply, we apply a lot of biologic therapies for patients with severe asthma. And um, for those, actually Gina, the, the Global Asthma Guidelines make a recommendation to not co-administer, especially when starting biologics, because the, um, the like uh, side reactions or the anaphylactic shock cannot be distinguished sometimes from the uh, from the vaccine reaction. And, and the starting, it's only at the start of the biologics that you should not co-administer the vaccine. But that's a very minor group, but it's an important group, I think, because those are very vulnerable patients, of course, starting on biologic therapies um, for, for, uh, for severe asthma. Um, and certainly co-administration also raises questions. You need to make sure you've got adequate controls so you're not making data errors and administration errors at the same time. 
Typically, like our, our government in Australia recommends separating vaccines by space or time to reduce the, the risk of doing an error. So you need to add in additional controls, such as talk back techniques and doing everything one by one and rather than trying to do all the paperwork together where you don't want errors in batch numbers and expiry dates and administration sites because they are, um, they are health procedures that do need to have accurate and safe administration. We'll take a big step back from co-administration and said if we just had to choose one vaccine, to give to everybody in our respiratory at-risk populations, which one would that be and why? And I'll, I'll ask you for like a, a really short answer to this, because I'm interested to see if we get the same answer or a different answer from our panellists. Um, Joe, you're on my top left, so we'll start with you and then Carmen. Um, I would say for COPD pneumococcal and for asthma influenza. Um, Carmen. Right, if it was just one, I, I would go for influenza for everybody. Probably pneumococcal. Um, it's not that they don't need it, but maybe they have had pneumococcal vaccination before. So if I have to use just one, uh, I would go for, for influenza because it's a virus that mutates and you need to, to get it uh, every season. Um, and being vaccinated three years ago doesn't give you immunity for this coming year. So. Um, Fiona, you're next on my screen. Yeah, I I agree with Carmen. I, I would go for, for influenza. I think looking at the whole population um, and giving one vaccine, probably influenza on basis of evidence and, and cost benefit gives the, the best um, value, I think. Yep, and Emma. So you haven't included age there, <laughs> so, <laughs> because depending on the age, it might be COVID. <laughs> but um, so definitely uh, for people aged 65 years and older, COVID. Uh, but I would go for what jobs uh, choices were. So influenza for asthma and uh, pneumococcal for COPD if the patient hasn't had uh, uh, pneumococcal vaccine before. Those would be my choices. Excellent. Um, and I, I think my vote was with Emma for uh, COVID-19 in terms of particularly got really older patients. Um, the, the, the risks for COVID-19 in really old patients are um, really challenging. That said, it's a somewhat artificial question because for most of us, we have access to multiple vaccines that we can provide to people, but it, it always provides um, interesting thinking. Um, if there's one thing that you could change, and again, this is a short question for everyone, one thing that you could change that would really help prioritise vaccination or suboptimal vaccination coverage in this population group, what would that be? And I might go in reverse order this time. We'll start with Emma. Uh, can you repeat the question? Sorry. If there was one thing that you could do to really help address the problem of suboptimal vaccination coverage, in the population group we're talking about today, which is people with um, respiratory diseases, what would that one thing be? Uh, give pharmacists the right to immunize, because I've seen a lot of comments from people in the chat uh, saying that in my country, we can't do that. So definitely uh, we've seen the differences in terms of uh, vaccination coverage in countries where pharmacists can vaccinate and uh, where they can't. So and even initial uh, data from the US where pharmacists started immunizing in some states and didn't in others, we could see uh, uh, differences in vaccination coverage uh, from those states. So definitely I would say pharmacists um, immunization. Yeah, um, Fiona. Um, so I, I'm gonna cheat slightly and, and give a, a combined answer. So I think I think having broad access to vaccinators and making more people able to vaccinate. So I, I agree very much with Emma. I think we should have pharmacists vaccinating, but I also think we've got lots of people who could easily be trained to vaccinate who aren't. And the best way to increase levels of vaccination is by um, being able to maximize those people that are in contact, the people that are in contact with people who might not be vaccinated is maximizing their ability to deliver that intervention and not having to refer on. But that would need to be joined up with centralized uh, access to a, to a vaccination register. Excellent, Carmen. 
Right. Um, I would. Um, I obviously totally agree with uh, Emma and Fiona. I think vaccination in, in the pharmacy would make a difference in terms of uh, compliance, in terms of uh, a time higher um, uptake of vaccination. And um, but if I have to focus in something, I probably would focus at least in those patients that are at a high risk, uh, like asthma in stages four or five. Or, or COPD patients with uh, FEV uh, under forty nine percent, maybe. And Joe, um, yeah, having looked and, and studied the global burden of disease slide that Emma showed, uh, I think the largest gain uh, would be in low middle income countries. So if we could increase uh, access and um, of, of vaccines in low middle income countries, I think we can have the highest gain in, in COPD and asthma mortality uh, that, that we could gain there, reducing that for, for asthma and COPD. So I would go for increasing access in low middle income countries, making them available for free there. And no matter who, who, sets, who, who puts the vaccine, being it a healthcare worker, a doctor, a pharmacist, nurse, I think that, that, that wouldn't mind, but as, as many places as possible. Mm. Um, all the techniques and the skill sets are the same and, and most health professionals are able to, to really be taken down that. We don't have too many more minutes left, so if you have a burning question, please put it in the Q&A box. We have a few more minutes left. I'm keen to talk um, a bit about health technology. Where do we think things could take us in the future? Um, how will our technology systems allow us to support our patients better? We've talked about funding. We've talked about... Uh, addressing misinformation. We've talked about um, education and workforce. Where do we think technology is going to take us in the future? Uh, I might put this to Emma first because she touched on this in her final slide. So hopefully she's had a few more thoughts rather than posing this question to everybody else cold. Yes, so, uh, well, definitely um, in interoperability. <laughs> so uh, we often are registering, uh, recording our interventions, uh, but then we are the only ones, um, well, seeing that uh, information. Uh, and uh, that is the case in, um, well, in many institutions and healthcare professionals. So I do think that we have to work on interop interoperability uh, of the different systems and also on a shared uh, patient record with different levels of access, of course, with features of opt-out, which uh, you have already mentioned. Uh, and um, well, uh, with uh, the, the, um, uh, a system that is traceable so that we know who is uh, viewing which data, but I think that we have to work towards uh, having systems where we avoid duplication, increase efficiency and increase, increase patient safety um, uh, due to uh, better shared information. Excellent. Joe, where do you think technology is going to take us in supporting this patient cohort? Yeah, I agree with Emma on the, the infrastructure, the IT infrastructure for healthcare professionals. Um, let me then see how we can take it forward on the patient side. And there, I think uh, e-health uh, becomes a, a huge uh, asset. We, we start using increasingly uh, within our hospital setting now with patient portals, uh, having them information being sent directly without them being at the hospital. So receiving those type of reminders uh, on their smartphones or their regular mobile phones. Uh, with also short movies, uh, educational movies that can be sent afterwards uh, in different languages, uh, also very lay language for people with low health literacy that we can uh, yeah, be, be more personal using technology um, to, to, to tailor our information towards the need of the patient in an electronic way. Excellent. Um, Karma? Right, um, I totally agree with, with them. I think uh, the main um, technology help would be sharing that, um, that information around vaccination. So we all would be able to know what recommendations we have to, to give to our, our patients if they have had vaccines or not, so and when they have had them. And, and also now um, maybe uh, APPs 
uh, for patients and remind them all the appointments or all the the vaccines that are due to to get at any time. Don't know. <laughs> And so I really like some of these things about connectivity and having systems that talk to each other effectively. Um, Fiona, do you have any other amazing technology predictions down the line? So no, I mean, I, I think everyone's ex explained it really well, but I think having that, that electronic um, record of immunisation that lots of people can access, but you can also see uh, in a really kind of blue sky uh, thinking um, how we could have that uh, education embedded within that um, sort of, uh, and there's lots of, I guess that's one of the things that's come from the pandemic is we're all very good at using um, online educational resources, but tailoring that for our patients would be really good and being able to link that so that they could have their alerts um, and that even that we could get alerts so that we could let people know if, if they were um, if they were due a vaccine and hadn't had it and then work to engage them in the conversation. I think uh, technology offers us lots of solutions, but integrating them together with the patients at the centre is probably um, uh, probably my kind of best vision of the future, I think. That's a lovely spot to leave, I guess, the wide ranging part of the chat. So it brings us back to that patient centric diagram that we saw in Emma's presentation. I'm going to ask our panellists today to join with one final message for everybody on the line today. What's the one thing that you would like them to take away from today's presentation? And I'll go in the order on my screen. So we'll start with Joe. Uh, hashtag vaccine save life. <laughs> that was mine. <laughs> Excellent. Carmen? My vaccines are safe and effective, so we we have to be aware of vaccination. We have to um, motivate our patients. We have to reassure our patients, and we have to um, encourage them to get vaccinated. Yes. Excellent, Fiona. Yeah, so I think just vaccines are safe and effective and they do save lives. Excellent. And Emma, your hashtag's been stolen, so I hope you've got another final message. Yes, I would say seize the opportunities. Uh, so, um, again, we've talked about pharmacists who can immunize, but even in countries where pharmacists cannot administer the vaccine, they can make a difference in terms of raising awareness, um, uh, uh, responding to people's uh, concerns and questions and uh, referring them to the physician. So I do think that we can all make a huge difference in terms of vaccine coverage. So please do take all the opportunity within with opportunities within your scope of practice, because there's always something we can do. So that would be the final message for me. And um, what a wonderful final message. Patients, respect healthcare professional recommendations stronger than any other factor in their decision to determine whether they accept a vaccine or not. And that's because we take them into our confidence and they take them, us into their confidence in exploring what is right for them and their health. And they tend to trust us over any other influence. So we're in a really privileged position and a very um, impactful position to be able to support patients. Please join me in thanking all of our fantastic panelists today. We've had an absolutely fantastic conversation. I can talk for a long time. I could talk for many more hours on this topic. Um, but please, if, if you've got the little icons, please join um, in applauding um, the time we've had today. I feel very privileged to have been part of this conversation. So thank you. Now, I've got the honour of doing a few promotions of some fantastic things FIP has coming up very soon. So the first of those is this year FIP is having a practice research special interest group summer meeting and that's going to be held um, very soon actually between the 4th and 5th of July at Utrecht University of Applied Scientists in Utrecht in the Netherlands. All PhD students and their supervisors, researchers, academics, professional organisations and practitioners involved in research are welcome to join this meeting to help build their global networks, um, present their research by submitting an abstract 
and increasing pharmacy practice contributions to global health. We have a QR code on the screen. We're all very familiar with those through the pandemic, depending where you are in the world. So please, if you are interested in that, do click on, um, do click through and, and learn more about this upcoming um, meeting. Um, the next one I'm particularly excited about, after having a couple of times we've had online congresses, we are, we are meeting face-to-face -face for FIP's annual congress in Seville this year. I'm super excited. I have my plane tickets booked. I cannot wait um, to see dear colleagues back face to face again. It's going to be really exciting. And the theme is really relevant this year. Pharmacy United in the recovering of healthcare. And depending where you are in the world, everyone's had a slightly different experience time wise. But the pandemic has been a massive shock to our health systems. Recovery for normal care, supporting a new disease that is becoming a part of our regular care now is really important. And we're going to spend some time um, meeting and talking about this. There are three topic themes that we'll be talking about. One is stop, never waste a crisis. What are our learnings for the next pandemic or future preparedness? The second topic is science and the evidence supporting the response to COVID-19. And topic three is dealing with new and extraordinary ethical challenges. You have the QR code there to access more information about the Congress. If you don't like QR codes, you can also go to seville2022.fip.org. You've got a couple of weeks to get into the early bird deadline. So if you haven't registered yet, do get involved. Um, it's going to be really fantastic to see everyone face to face and to share um, in a lot of our learnings as we have today. We do quite a few online events with FIP. So we have our FIP digital events you can find out more about at events.fip.org. Um, and I think from memory that may be the close to the last slide, um, but thank you for attending um, this morning, this afternoon or tonight, depending where you are in the world, if you joined us live or any time if you've caught up with the recorded webinar. Again, I thank our fantastic panellists who've joined us today, their experience. I've learned a lot. I hope you've learned a lot too. And we look forward to joining you for the next opportunity for FIP digital events. Thank you.